welcome. I don't know if this is on yet. Is it? Yeah. Right. It's great to see all of you here this evening. And thank you. You know, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight, but also thanking the panelists for traveling from far and close to share the moment of Four Freedoms. And then also, I'd like for all of the Four Freedoms people, staff, um, artists who are here in the room to stand up for and wave hand for a second. Can you wave one? And also the CBBC um, staff and Okay. <laughs> but tonight it's, it's just really exciting to celebrate the release of the new book and the first book. Um, where do we go from here and how do we think about uh, where do we go from here specifically with this week coming up. And um, it's authored and edited by Hank Williams Thomas, Eric Gottesman, Wyatt Gallery, Michelle Poole, Taylor Brock, and published by two wonderful publishers. Where are the publishers? Are they here? Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> well, you can stand up so we can just acknowledge you so people can see you later. Yeah. Okay, can you can you all stand up from the, from the press? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Co editor. Um, but before we begin, I um, just want to acknowledge um, these wonderful speakers here and um, just to a quick intro and hopefully you had an opportunity to visit the exhibition. So are we going down the road this way or, or are we just not freestyle, right? Okay. Freestyle, thank okay. you. <laughs> Taylor Brock is a cultural producer and creative stra strategic uh, person serving as the associate director at, at Four Freedoms. Wyatt Gallery is a, a person, not a place. He's a Philadelphia native, currently living in Trinidad, and has um, is a co-founder uh, for Four Freedoms. Also, with Eric Gottesman, he teaches, organizes, and writes um, about art, makes images, and, and also thinking constantly about other people and their lives. So when we think about his work, we can also look at these wonderful bios later, but I wanted to get through uh, opportunity to have a chance to talk. And Hank Willis Thomas, you know, one of my favorite people in the world, <laughs> is a conceptual artist known for his investigation of looking into the archives, thinking about the media, and working in the idea of what it means to think about freedom. How do we reframe freedom and how do we consider the term freedom today? And so I'd like to just open up by um, just talk about why this project. Because you can't say no to Hank. <laughs> <laughs> and where did he get that from? <laughs> so true. <laughs> But you know, you moved um, from Four Freedoms to billboards. What what did, what does billboards mean to you in your life? You grew up. Where did you grow up in Philadelphia? You grew up. Where did you grow up? New Hampshire. In New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So, what do billboards mean to each of you when you happen to see a billboard? If you're traveling or you're living in the city, what message did they deliver over time? I think billboards are extremely ugly and um, just an eyesore to our environment, personally. Um, so to put art on them is a great improvement. <laughs> and I think that um, our greatest success is when we confuse a passerby enough, to, like this one behind me, uh, people emailed us asking, what does this mean? Translate Allah. I also did not know what it meant and had to Google it. So, um, I think that if we can utilize these public art spaces that are made for commercial marketing activities to make people question or think a little bit differently, then it, they become exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 
Um, yeah, so I'm from Tennessee. We have many billboards there. Um, and to me, I mean, a billboard, particularly in Tennessee at this time of year, is often reserved for political messages and candidates. Going to hell, fine come now kind of billboards. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I started at Fort Freedom, so I started at Fort Freedoms eight and a half years ago. Um, I was the first employee, and then I was going to leave and go get a real job, <laughs> and still here. Um, and right when I started, Hank and Eric were like, okay, Taylor, figure out how to get billboards. And so big Hank and I mm -hmm. um, <laughs> kind of got together and decided to just call a bunch of billboard companies. And through that process, I learned a lot more about billboards and about the role of billboards. Um, of course, billboards are always trying to sell you something, trying to tell you something. But even the process of learning that there's four states that don't allow billboards was something new. You can try to guess what they are. We can play trivia later. Actually, trivia now. Do you know which four states it is? Maine. Maine. Okay. Um, we need to speak directly in the oh, mic. Can sorry. you put it closer? Okay. Other ones? No. Hawaii. Okay. And then. You just keep saying your name is like that. Alaska? Yeah. 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 Wow. yeah, so even learning that, or when we were getting these billboards, I would tell um, the billboard companies that we were putting art in billboards, and we were a bunch of artists who wanted to put billboard art on there. Um, and then we'd send them the billboards, and they'd be like, oh, no, 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 we, like, you don't get, these are political, and the political rate is double the cost of what we gave you. And I would spend a lot of time being like, no, it's not, it's not political, it's really just art. And like, start asking this man who works at Lamar Billboards in Louisiana, like, what does it mean to be political? Uh, so it led down some really interesting conversations, but I think a lot of it is, um, as we've done this also, you know, they'll come back and be like, billboard companies would come back and deny billboards. Every campaign we've ever done, we had several billboards that have been rejected, and I've had to work to kind of move them around. And I think that's become a conversation about kind of controlling, you know, um, speech and, and who has control of that. And there's multiple levels of billboard companies, landlords, all these different groups that are also co-signing and deciding what can be said and what can't be said in a public space. Take it from there. <laughs> no, I mean, I, Can you all hear in the back? Is it? Okay, great. I mean, um, I'm thinking about your question, Deb, of like what billboards meant to me personally. I haven't really thought about that, but like the, the, your first question, why did the book come about is because people have supported us like Colleen and, and Michael Keegan from the beginning and, and Levon Kilner and Tom Rausch and, um, you know, uh, Sharon Hoffman and, and Barbara Schuster and other people from the beginning, uh, Ellen Sussman, that really saw the possibility of what this project was when we proposed this. I mean, artists have put work on billboards before, including people in this room. Um, there's a long history of artists, um, you know, putting art out into the public in this way, but to start thinking about it in a kind of systematic strategy and cultural strategy. And then, you know, for the folks at Monticelli and Fiden to, to be thinking about, um, what this might mean as a book, it, it, it really inspired us to, to put it out there in this way, um, where we didn't really necessarily know what it meant which makes me think of my relationship to billboards as a kid, which is that my dad is a lawyer. He like um, has his own small firm in New Hampshire. And uh, I remember talking to him as a kid about like how to get his name out there. And he would, every year he would take out a yellow page in the yellow pages. And that would be his way of like connecting to the community and getting his name out to the community. and. Um, my brother ended up going into advertising and suggesting at some point that my dad dress up like in a chicken suit and um, like, you know, do a whole like advertisement as a lawyer on TV in a chicken suit, uh, which my dad did not do. Um, but I think like there was that, that kind of like mischievousness of like, oh, what can we do in this space that's all, um, you know, that's all buttoned up and that's like intended for a specific thing and we could hijack it into something else uh, well I, I um, my relationship with billboards what do they mean to me I think in New York uh, 
I, I don't recall seeing many billboards that growing up. I, that may be why I became more and more fascinated with them. I, I really started to think about billboards co critically actually in a uh, class here at NYU. Um, I went to NYU uh, 30 years ago, I started. Uh, that's where I met this gentleman. Um, and an uh, artist named Larry Sultan came by to talk about his practice with uh, Mike Mandel of reclaiming billboards to turn them into art. And I never really thought about what a billboard is. And, and later I realized that billboards actually are the most ubiquitous art forms, uh, art spaces in, in the country. They're like everywhere. However, they're not used or thought of as a place to actually challenge or even grow and expand our ideas. Um, they're actually mostly utilized as a tool of like social control and conditioning. And, uh, but I just became super curious about this idea of the blank canvas. And I don't know how we got to billboards. I know when we started Four Freedoms in 2016, we started as a super PAC. And we really started as a super PAC because we wanted to challenge the idea of what the role of an artist is in civic life. Um, that there uh, seems to be a dearth of creative ideas um, that, you know, some of us uh, and, and many of the artists we knew and know are always thinking about the future. And that means you have to be thinking creatively. Uh, and so I um, took a page out of my mom's book of uh, when, when no one's interested, you just get more interested and find other people <laughs> <laughs> to like, to, to, to spread the word. And um, it's been fascinating thinking about being in my studio with my, my dad and Taylor and, and, and Wyatt and, and Eric and Michelle. Um, and then um, get to see um, Miguel Luciano and Natalie Frank and well, Candida, we have not worked with you, which is a big mistake, Candida yeah. Alvarez. Um, but seeing all of these, and just seeing Joaquin, all these amazing people and Janice Noor, like all these people who kind of have count, become a part of this idea um, that really started with a pretty earnest and maybe uh, ignorant concept, um, which was when Eric called me um, asking me to run for public office. <laughs> um, uh, and I realized that he was actually joking, but <laughs> and I would be the joke. No, I'm like, <laughs> uh, but the but the idea that that yeah we don't belong on the sidelines. We actually belong in the discourse of something that I feel like this book, which has 600 plus billboards, most of which um, almost everyone creatively white has had his hands on. Um, and Taylor has, uh, and June, who I don't think I see here, have been like integral in like intimately getting every one of these into the world, which is really amazing when you think about that. And many of them are seen by 70 million people um, and it's so countless eyeballs have been impacted so consciously and sometimes consciously by um, this work. And so I feel like I'm still, this is our first time to really actually be able to look at it all and be like, what does this all mean? And just in concept of the news this past week, uh, I, uh, I did see Miguel Luciano, whose billboard says uh, that he put up in Puerto Rico said statehood, uh, challenging. Uh, um, conversations about the role of the island of Puerto Rico in, in society, it seems so timely now. And, and, the, and you'll, I think you'll find that a lot of the billboards are more relevant now than they were even when they were created. Idea of, of public art, Wyatt, you mentioned um, this is a message basically about public art. Do you want to talk about how access how you feel about access and public art? Well, okay, you can see on this map where we, this was just 2018, not the entire eight years, but um, I think that probably most of us in this room are people that identify with art. We feel comfortable with art. We feel comfortable going to a gallery or viewing art, but there's a lot of people out there that don't feel that way. And they don't think that a gallery or a museum is a space for them. And putting art in the public is taking the art to them. 
it's not something where they have to make a choice to go and say, today I'm going to go and look at art. You know, so I think it's it's important to bring it to the person, to the public, to um, a community of Americans that are, are not thinking in that way or thinking about um, what can art do for me or how will this impact my uh, thought process or perspective on, on my world. So I think that that's what the billboards have done. Um, I think that a lot of what we do is, is really hard to, um, it's hard, it's hard to calculate or graph the impact. It's hard to really know it. Um, but I think that like Hank said, yes, the billboards might get seen by 70 million people. And we're just not gonna, we're not gonna have records of every person's thought and interaction, but they're there. <laughs> Take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> and that would be enough too. Yeah. But it was really exciting to be a part of this project. It was really exciting for me to be a part of this project because I know the impact of, of billboards is growing up in, in traveling. My dad used to road trips often and I often read um, the messages. And so how do we think about the message in terms of controlling not only speech, but controlling a neighborhood? And also what do we sell in terms of body types and, and images through that? So I'm curious also about your artists. How did you find your artists and, and select? Pretty arbitrarily. Yeah, it's very <laughs> arbitrary. <laughs> I mean, some of them were related to, uh, and <laughs> some of them we just admire. Some of them we reached out to and asked. Um, overwhelmingly positively. I mean, that there was really a generosity of spirit and of of like wanting to participate that I like constantly surprises me in in terms of like the scale of collaboration. I mean, like. When you when you are in a book with 500 other people, it's like you know there's there's a lot that goes into that, and it's like challenging as an artist to think about what does it mean for my work to be contextualized like alongside so many other artists' work. Will my voice get drowned out? Like, but I, I'm consistently surprised at how much willingness there is among the artist community to to join together and like push forward as a community. urban versus rural how you know just in terms of growing up in in your area um, but also when we think about road trips and travel you know we, when I was a kid you know route 66 was the the big storytelling moment for and safe travel for many of us but I was curious about where you, what cities did you decide to stop and think about what message you wanted to explore in that city. Yeah, I think it's shifted as um, over time and as time has gone on. Um, our first billboard campaign, which we did in 2016, so we had an exhibition at Jack Shaman Gallery here, and we took the artwork and worked with the designer to turn it into billboards. Um, 2018, we, and where we placed it, we placed it mostly in swing states. Some of them were very, um, specific locations, but generally we just put them in swing states and can put them up. 2018, we decided we wanted to focus, we wanted it one, to be bigger. We wanted a, a billboard in all 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico. We called it the uh, largest creative collaboration in US history. We still don't know if that's true, but we think it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then we, we reached out to artists and invited artists to um, contribute their own work. And as Eric said, it's always been overwhelmingly positive and kind of the responses we've received from artists and because the artists are creating it now we try to tailor it more so to is it somewhere that the artist is from or working with um, or a community they've worked with or uh, topic wise is it some connection and sometimes it's you know and so we really split it we try to do it nationwide and have you know each campaign is different and how we do it so we've had 2020 we asked artists what is the question that's most important, that's most urgent to ask right now? So every billboard was based around questioning. Uh, but we've also done a billboard 
um, that was land back and was all with indigenous artists. And so we, it was about a land back campaign. So where we placed it also kind of depends on what the overarching message or mission is of the buildings. In terms of feedback and messages from the community, not only the the city, the government, but I'm just curious about the curious about community membership. Yeah, well, in in 2016, we right after we'd done our first 14 billboards. Um, in, um, turn up the sound turn on. on this thing on. on. Thanks. My wife is <laughs> telling me take the mic off the stand. Uh, you. Yes. <laughs> um, well, yeah. So in, in 2016, we, we, um, had just completed our first billboard campaign and really weren't, we were thinking, okay, it's we're going to do this project and then we're done. It's our project. Um, and right uh, after we finished the campaign, um, we, why, we were in South Africa and everyone but we were at Black Portraiture's <laughs> yeah. conference in South Africa. And we're, we were actually standing around the courtyard and I got a message on my phone and it was a death threat. And I thought, what, what is this? What is this the right number? What's going on here? <laughs> And I, we had a Google voice number for Four Freedoms at the time that went to my email. And so I started getting all these transcript messages all of a sudden, standing in the middle, in the break from your, your conference, saying, uh, you need to take down this billboard. And what, what are you thinking you're doing? This is, you know, this is terrible. So uh, it was the Make America Great Again billboard. And... Um, I don't know if you ever know, knew that, but yeah. So that that's what Hank was referencing. Yeah, and and so this, this, this someone eventually we call we call Eric, you tell it. The, the yeah. person that got because basically we're like in South Africa, like we're doing this conference, all excited, and all of a sudden we're thinking like someone's okay. that we're like maybe really in, in in trouble. And this billboard, which is a billboard image of uh, it's a photograph by Spider Martin of. Um, Jose, Jose Williams and, um, and, and John Lewis and others facing down the uh, Alabama state, state troopers and uh, what became known as Bloody Sunday. And a question that was not asked sufficiently in the billion plus dollars that was spent in the 26th campaign uh, when the, the then presidential candidate said, make America great again, which every president, five previous presidents had also stated uh, hey, what, what was so different about what he meant? <laughs> and then also, when was America greater than it is today? And the only time that I think the most consensus might even be around the civil rights mo movement where ordinary citizens, did, many of whom disenfranchised and disempowered, uh, stood up with dignity, grace, and love and faith uh, to challenge the status quo and its brutality. and change the, sh the the direction of the country um that that was not all written on the billboard <laughs> so uh people seeing the billboard which was along the same highway but actually in mississippi um were wondering like so they were like are you guys which what side are you on they're like are you are you encouraging police brutality or are you saying that people should um should be fighting the police and and, and like and so the the kind of amazing moment for me was when CNN, CNN which makes its money by making uh, us anxious and and revving us up with its 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 um heads headline said Mississippi residents unsure of controversial billboards intent. <laughs> it's like <laughs> like <laughs> and that was really kind of uh, for me a really big sign that it's actually when they can't put it in a box regardless of like how much we have a thesis and what we wanted to say, that it was open to interpretation that, that we were actually transcending, um, doing, you know, we started to actually do something we really wanted to do or something that was unique. I think it gets to kind of what we're talking, the first question about like, what do billboards mean to you or this where billboards are so often telling you what to do, what to think, who to vote for, what to buy. And I think putting art up there, which is not, 
telling you about that. My wife says you should the circles. hold Rue's, the billboard. Sorry, the Rue, is this okay? Can you hear me? Oh, thank you, Rue. Okay. Um, sorry, Rue also wrote an essay for this book. So it's one that <laughs> she, wanted, she wanted to hear that. You make sure you heard that. Um, so I think billboards are so often telling you exactly what to do. And I think art asks questions. And part of art is to ask, is encouraging, inviting you in and giving you agency to think critically and think critically about your own life and where we go from, where you are and where you go from here. And I think this moment that this billboard couldn't be put into a box and people from, everyone was mad at us. People from all sides were mad at us um, and asking us, what does this mean? And no one could really figure it out. And I think that's um, moments when art can kind of really show its power is in um, making us really take a second and consider and think in a way that so so little of the world asks us to right, regularly, especially billboards. But I think it's really important that there are words and phrases that I see repeated over time. And you, as you mentioned, you know, quietly you're getting people to think critically, but also you're having the opportunity to have people dream. And I've seen the term dream in in these moments in the billboards. I want to talk about how these phrases. Okay, great. Um, there's there are seats over here if someone wants to come in. Yeah, dream is actually the last word in the book um, because it was on a billboard um, by an artist uh, who made the billboard in 2023 as part of a, a billboard about um, a billboard campaign around, about the um, the transcontinental railway, and uh, he made this billboard uh, right before he died. Actually, it was it was the last artwork that he made and was up and his family was able to visit it in, in Los Angeles when, when he was, uh, you know, shortly after his death, it was still up. And, but I think it's a fitting, it is a fitting word to have up there. And I think, um, I guess two thoughts. One, when we, when I think about the language that's on these billboards, the box that they're trying to put stuff in, put language and images in changes, the box itself changes. And so, something that says um, all lies matter, one of Hank's billboards, means something different in 2015 when he made it, means something different in 2016, means something different 2020 when we put it up, means something different this year when, you know, when it's, when it may be, you know, it's, it, it's been banned. And so we get to see the difference in how language is governed in public space and what, what things what images, what languages, what words, what ideas are right on the edge of what media companies, billboard companies will allow. Um, and, and that shapes, that gives us a sense of how the contours of our public conversations are shaped and what we need to be pushing up against. Um, but I do think that that idea of dreaming is something that I connect back, Taylor, to something you invented when you were here as a student, which was, my, so I graduated from Gallatin, and my Gallatin concentration was creative democracy. Um, that's which, which I think, I mean, I think was so interesting as a college student that you understood that like democracy itself could be a medium for creativity and for art making, and that this public discourse that undergirds like democratic practice and democratic thinking actually is a space ultimately for creativity if we want to focus on where we're going. Um, yeah, I think, oh, sorry. I think for me, something that I learned through my time at NYU was seeing democracy less as like a destination to get to, or like a static entity and something that you're, um, constantly being and working towards, but also working with. And so I think thinking of creative democracy as something that's continued, democracy is something that is ever shifting and malleable and creative and requires, um, constant invention, reinvention, learning and unlearning and relearning um, to exist. I think that was something that I took through my time here that then has kind of the seeds have continued to sow throughout my time at Four Freedoms as well. What about education pack packages or programs? Do you have education programs for um, 
K to 12, but also for others to understand what it means to have public art, but also to think and rethink and reimagine life um, through these billboard experiences. Yeah, Mom. <laughs> yeah, do it, start it. <laughs> um. One of the things that's also kind of been really fun about this project is um, early on, like Frances White was our executive director. Um, Not the and, dream. And yeah. Right. No. Uh, Wyatt was our executive director of, of our super PAC. None of us could actually define what a super PAC was, uh, which meant that Eric and I really didn't really have a, a clear role or job. Um, but a lot of times when we'd be on, people would ask us questions it's like, so have you thought about, you know, doing anything like this? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> how how might we do this? And they're like, well, I know somebody who knows how to do that. And then literally, I, I think the project kind of grew really organically. I, I, as you see Florian, uh, who, who led a project with Google uh, uh, um, and a group of photographers challenging um, the way that many of us are represented in images and reconsidering that. And that came, I think, as a response to just us opening the space for it um, and uh, th there are these moments where I think the billboards lead us um, and but I, I do think I see I saw Emily Hanako Momohara who's a great educator and artist um, who made a really great billboard that said never again is now um, talking that's hanging up at the Corcoran that's talking about but was talking about internment of children and others in our, within our country um, and it would be really great if that person might consider making a module uh, for us. Because um, we do have a really unique opportunity in this moment where Eric uh, somehow tricked the National Gallery of Art and um, the Corcoran School, <laughs> the Corcoran, Corcoran School of Art at G, you know, uh, GW into giving us how much space? 6,000 square feet. 6, feet <laughs> um, and three years uh, to program um, exhibitions and projects. Um, the Corcoran Gallery, which used to be a museum, is an amazing space, but it's literally the, one of the closest buildings to the White House. You can see the White House from the steps. Um, and the National Gallery is the closest building to the U.S. Capitol building. Uh, so this is a building where the marchers on January 6th walked past. And January 6, 1943 is when FDR gave this famous F, uh, Four Freedom speech, which kind of launched a, a lot of many, many ships. Um, and there's an incredible opportunity for us to be thinking about what it would like look like at either NYU or at GW to have in, a Four Freedoms Institute that a, allows us to build off of Taylor's, she's got another master since then, <laughs> Two of them. <laughs> how did you, but how did you encourage them um, to do that? How did you yeah, trick them? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I have been teaching for a while, um, and so yeah, I have taught some of this stuff, and students have like some of the students have been included in our in our campaigns. They've done their own thing. I was able to teach down at Young Arts, where where some of the students created. Um, you know, a billboard, uh, a perspective billboard. Um, so there definitely have been ways to kind of adapt this. And I think um, what, what my speculation about what they see as what we could bring to a collaboration between the National Gallery, which is one of the most visited museums in the country, the, the, the canonical museum of the federal government, a university right across the street from the White House and us is that, you know, we can bring this idea of infiltration that we brought to kind of billboard media space to institutional space. And so we can actually bring artists in in a way that shifts what the institutions are capable of and what the box is of these institutions. I think, I don't know. <laughs> Wyatt, do you want to add to the whole aspect of it was separate, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I just, you know, I'm just looking out in the audience. I saw a couple of the Billboard artists here, Justin and Graham and a few others. And I, I think one of the unique 
parts of this project is that we didn't just put up our art or our ideas. And we're just really a catalyst and a bridge um, to say, hey, artists, what do you want to put up? And uh, we, we don't really interfere much in that. We may offer some design suggestions, but that's about it, um, lightly. So I, I just thought it could be interesting to hear from yeah. some of the billboard artists, like what their experience was of having their work on a billboard. But one, one before I open up, I was going to do that. So oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. But I, I wanted to find out international response. I was curious about that. How, you said it was in Amsterdam or other cities. How did the... Yeah. We've had billboards in, um, in London and in, in, in Tokyo. Um, but the message, were the artists local or international? Actually, they've all been kind of internet, uh, from, I think from... Uh, yeah, they're all representations. They're all representations, but many of the artists who were part of the project are not American. Um, and I think there's an opportunity, why it lives in Trinidad. Um, there are opportunities, uh, Eric does a lot of work in Lebanon, um, for us to really expand that. Um, however, um, we are, this, it's really weird. What's made us unique in, is that we're just a bunch of artists and we have always approached this as an art project. We've never, unfortunately, approached this as a business. Uh, so <laughs> we've seen a million and one brilliant ideas and things we started. John Santos, who designed all, uh, all, yeah, all the 2016 billboards. Um, um, and we've worked with so, so much talent and had, if we were a corporation, I can't even imagine how to, the level of impact we would be, we would be bragging about what we've, we've had. Um, but frankly, every time we've set up an organization, we've been like, let's do something different. So uh, I'm actually excited because this residency is culminating um, on, in 2026, which is the semi-sequicentennial, 250th anniversary. How do you say that again? Yeah. Semi <laughs> semi-sequicentennial, um, right? Sem semi-quincentennial, sorry, semi-quincentennial. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so semi-quincentennial. Uh, 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 it happens to be me and Eric's 50th birthday year, um, and Ulrika Thunberg, who I went to first grade with, uh, was over there. Um, but there's like, I think that will either be the end of this collaboration or the beginning uh, to, to John Santos's billboard. Is this the, what, what did your billboard say? Is this the be end of the? Beginning of the next. Is this the end of the world or, or the beginning of the next? I think that's a question that a lot of us will be thinking a lot about in 2026. And so there might be more than one reason to be doing this project in another country. <laughs> So thanks for the suggestion. <laughs> so I'd like to pass the, the mic. Uh, we have 10 minutes before seven, and I was curious if some of the artists who are here uh, would like to say a few words. Um, Justin's the closest to you. <laughs> Justin's right there, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think what you guys did Pulling this project together was uh, phenomenal. I thought it was amazing that we had uh, such an opportunity and you guys extended so many artists, invited so many artists to uh, collaborate um, and participate. Um, I'd never seen anything like this when you guys first came up with this idea. I, uh, you guys know I work with billboards, uh, message signs that go on the sides of highways that flash. Um, but I'd never seen anything like this before and I just thought it was a phenomenal project and I was really, um, honored uh, to be part of it. And, uh, you know, I hope, you know, one of the things that I try to do with all my work, and I think almost everybody here that you guys worked with on uh, this project, we're all trying to have an impact. And uh, I think that, you know, billboards and uh, volume in terms of eyeballs, it's it's hard to beat uh, a billboard, you know, on a highway, so, or in a city. So anyway, I'm just, uh, I'm grateful. Uh, thank you. Writer in the front row. Um, I, the I just have a, I have a question. I don't have anything to say about my essay, but the book is beautiful. Everyone should buy it. 
Well, I was really happy to look through the archive of the billboards in writing my essay because it is a really incredible archive um, and there are so many rich ideas and beautiful images. But one of the things I was struck by in looking through the archive and again today was actually the landscape um, of the United States and how much this project really has lived by the kind of photography, the installation photography and what it kind of says about our country and the parts of our country that so many of us, particularly who live in New York, in LA, on the East and the West Coast, have not seen. And so I was curious about how you all, and I know Wyatt, I've heard Wyatt has coordinated a lot of these photographs, um, but I'm just curious about how that aspect of it, the kind of context, because when we think about artworks, even public art, whether in the gallery or public art, the context of it is so important. And here it's like, there's New York City, there's cities that are recognizable, there's rural landscapes, there's highways, there's literally all like seasons. There's just so much happening kind of outside of the image of the billboards. And I don't know if that's a question, but that is what I am thinking about. So if you have anything to say about that, please. Well, I mean, funny enough, you know, just to show you how much we don't think through things when we're doing it, <laughs> um, when we did the first, set of billboards it was like an afterthought where we put them up and i was like wait a second we need to have photographs of these billboards <laughs> um but it's too late to try to like hire someone so i as a photographer who went to nyu with hank here uh i said okay i'm, I'm just going to go on a road trip and photograph all these billboards and um so i think that was an important step and since then we've realized that yes the photographs of the billboard are at least 50% of the strength of putting the billboards up. Um, and what we did was we tried to target architectural photographers in each of these areas to photograph it as a monument, as a object um, in a way that the art can, can really be center stage in the environment and show the different environments. And honestly, um, with the development and the ease of drones, over the last couple of years, I think our photography has really improved through using drones and getting a little bit more of a, a straight on view. But yeah, I mean, there's just so many different and we don't always know the environments. Yeah, but I would say that a lot a lot of the reasons the photos look the way they do is because of Wyatt Gallery okay. um, and the way the, the reason the book looks the way it does. But especially with the photographs, um, I think we all get annoyed with Wyatt sometimes because he, when we're, you know, working on finding these billboards, we'll be like, we'll, we'll get a bunch of options from the billboard companies and go through, go through and choose the best one based on price, based on location, based on who the artist is. And, um, Wyatt has just such an eye for it. And we'll go through and be like, no, none of these will work. They're not going to photograph well. We'll be like, Wyatt, we can't go back and choose more. Um, but every time. It's so well worth it and all of the photos they they truly do look the way they do because of why it's eye and heart that he brings to this um in terms of artists speaking well i think you have something to say but then i want maya man to say something because maya is an artist in the billboard and my favorite article about one of my favorite headlines about four freedoms ever was forbes wrote about um our aapi billboard campaign and it was a photo of maya's billboard and the headline was does art have to be ugly to affect change <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so yeah, my name is Maya Man. My, my billboard was for AAPI Month in 2021. Um, and for context, it was an image of myself around age 13 photo I took, and it said, "The model minority is a myth. Call this number for truth." And you could call the number, and then there's a recording of me speaking about the model minority myth. Um, and for me, this was really amazing because I had recently gone on a cross country road trip and I had driven past so many billboards, um, especially so many gospel billboards that were, you know, that had a number to offer to call. And I was so bored alone once on my road trip that I called the number and, um, it was a very formative experience for me. And so when I was commissioned for this billboard, it was really exciting to be able to take that experience with an actual billboard and work that into the piece that I made. Um, yeah, but I think a lot of people talk about, um, 
advertising online, they often use billboards as an analogy, um, sort of a way to grab attention when you're scrolling through the feed. Um, and I think speaking to what Wyatt was saying, um, having an image on a billboard, even if so many people won't see the actual billboard, but having the image operate as an image on a billboard really makes an impact in a new way when we're so accustomed to sort of the the hose of images that we are consuming all the time, given the stream of media. Um, so I think it's a really special project and it elevates and focuses on the way that we perceive images in a, in a specific way. So it was very exciting to be part of it. Thank you. Yes. Joshua Allen. Of I, hi, I'm Nicole Fleetwood. I wanted to, um, work. I wanted to say I, I did one with Keith Lamar, who's currently on death row in Ohio. And um, it was an incredible transformative experience for both of us and led to a full page um, article inquiring into his death row sentence. Um, he's still on death row and we are actively working to get him off death row. So look up Keith Lamar in prison in Ohio. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. my name is Graham uh, McIndoe, and I have a picture in there, uh, but first I want to uh, thank Wyatt for uh, getting me involved in this and a couple of other Four Freedoms projects past, and one, one that I did recently is an oral history for Rikers Island, and um, yeah, I, it was weird doing it because I was out of context, I knew, I'd seen a few of them and I didn't know the breadth and extent of this whole thing until I got the book and I've been immersed in it several times since and it's quite a phenomenal achievement and uh, I take my hat off to you guys for doing that and there's so many powerful, powerful billboards in there that touch me pretty deeply actually, you know, not just the political aspects of it, you know, that personally I, was, I had, you know, had a long period of addiction and then incarceration and being subjected to immigration detention and deportation proceedings as well for a long time and it was a past life it seems like now but to see all these things being touched on amongst other things like race and poverty and everything like that is really 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 important because there's so much gets unsaid and so much that is why it said is foreign to people because they don't go to galleries and they don't read the magazines we read and they don't gravitate towards certain things but they do look at billboards because everybody drives, it's America, right? Everybody's on the road and they're seeing these billboards and, you know, to see, when I saw my one, which is in, where was it? Pittsburgh. Um, it was amazing to see this huge big picture of self-portrait of me with a text on it and everything. And I was just like, wow, I know someone in Pittsburgh as well and they're gonna see this and it's, you know, I mean, I think it's a really powerful way of planting subconscious messages into people that they might not get right away, but they'll go away thinking about it later on and say, what was that about? And beg a question. And if it just changes somebody's mind and makes them question something about society, then that's an achievement. I would also like to say that I was good friends with Ross McDonald, and it was really gratifying to see his picture as the last picture in the book. It means a lot, and I've shared that with his family, and it's also his birthday today. Thank you. And Joshua, right there. Talk about your billboard. <laughs> I am loving seeing you and Hank <laughs> co co directing, uh, taking charge here. We got we got here. You know, Mike in the back, and you have Mike in the front. Uh, this is fantastic. We'll be quick. Um, I need at least thirty more minutes of this. Uh, my name is Florian. I wanted to add two things. First, to emphasize uh, gratitude to the catalysts. My career has largely been in advertising and marketing. And one of the most impactful things I've been told in a classroom was in an adult uh, photography class. Our professor was a documentary journalist. And he said, my job is to untrain you guys from the torrent of shitty images that you see every single day. And framed that way, when I felt the weight of the book, I think it made clear that this is the remedy to that. Um, this is positive overwhelm and reinforcement. And I think the medium in particular, to echo what you just said, really nailed that, especially over the amount of time. Um, and I know that even with all you've said, we only understand a fraction of the effort that goes into that. So really, thank you. Because I think many of us wouldn't have had this platform 
uh, and it's extraordinary. The second thing I'll offer, my experience with my billboard was a weird learning moment about what to be proud of because when we found out where we were placed, our billboard uh, was a collaborative effort with another friend, um, Yelda Ali, and a few other graphic artists. Um, Yelda has had a partner who's been incarcerated for a long time, and so we chose to deal with that topic. And the billboard reads, or the land of the free, and it's wrapped in um, prison barbed wire. And I used an NBA playoff game as an excuse to get two friends to drive up to Boston to photograph the billboard hanging on the outside of um, whatever the Red Sox thing is. Uh, <laughs> clearly a born and raised New Yorker. I don't even allow it to like stay in my brain. Fenway, thank you. Uh, only to arrive and find out that it had already been removed within 12 hours of the timeline that it was supposed to have gone up because clearly it had such a charged response from the community. And seeing that as a kind of win. Obviously, I think the bigger win is that so many of these things stayed up. Um, but then having to make pilgrimage to Connecticut to see that and understand that that actually might have been those few hours might have been the more impactful placement than the longer placement over that highway because it clearly forced an engagement to your point. Um, I think it's I, I'm overwhelmed by the magnitude of the project and I'm so grateful. Can you also just talk about your fellowship while you're at it? The, the collaboration? Our little thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Thank you. With this brilliant organization, um, last year we were able to support 20 up and coming image makers in the United States through what we call their Image Equity Fellowship. Uh, I understand from my friends who are more in the arts space that it was a pretty uh, large sum of money that we were able to offer those artists to support themselves, many of whom have really taken an amazing next step into their careers with grad school programs, museum acquisitions. Uh, as a result of this collaboration. So again, just grateful to y'all for choosing to work with us. Um, hi, my name is Emily Hanokomomohara. I was the one that Hank threw under the bus to write that curriculum earlier. But, um, um, I just wanted to share, what we were talking about landscape and place, and my um, two billboards were the Never Again Is Now and their pictures from World War II, the Japanese American incarceration. And um, one of, or two of them were accidentally were put at, well, in Idaho where my family was incarcerated near Minidoka uh, Relocation Center. And seeing the images, I didn't actually get to go and see the billboards when they were up, but seeing the images of that landscape, you know, almost melding with the landscape that is in the historic image of the barracks and of the two little kids that are uh, kind of walking down the path was so impactful. Um, for me personally, I hope that people that saw it in the area, because uh, the camp is actually a national park now. So um, hopefully, and that's popular for some, not for others. Um, so hopefully that had some more humanistic kind of impact on, on the folks that were around. And then that same image was actually taken to Japan in Tokyo, and most Japanese folks don't know that Japanese Americans were incarcerated during World War II. So that was a really interesting conversation to have as well. So I, I feel like I'm really grateful that, um, like Taylor was talking about, connecting the artist with the spaces. I feel like that really worked for, for my work, and it was just an amazing moment. Hi, I'm Natalie Frank, and it's nice to meet everyone. I haven't seen a lot of people in person except for Hank. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. It was really amazing to create an image. I worked with Zoe Buckman, and we created a mural that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And it was quotes from politicians, mostly Republicans, including Trump, that they, of things that they had said about women and their bodies, like girls, they rape so easy. Um, and we had a sort of side panel with photos of the politicians identifying people and linking them to their quotes, and it was at the Corcoran. And it was really interesting for me in so many ways, but at the, at the exact same time, I had just made 
a series of drawings from a book called The Story of O, and it was censored. And it was drawings, and I made a book, um, I often work from literature, um, to talk about the history of this book and sex positive feminism. So on one hand, there's a, there, you know, a, a woman artist who's making feminist work that's being censored, and yet, you know, this, the, these things are all being said still about women. So it was kind of this terrible irony, but it um, felt very kind of free and like an incredible gift to be able to show this and not have it be censored <laughs> and have it stay up across from the White House. So thank you. Hello, um, my name is Miguel Luciano, and I um, want to also start by saying thank you. Um, it was it, at first like amazing to work with um, everybody here, but I'm grateful that, um, you feel, that you featured a billboard in Puerto Rico, and um, there were some great artists from Puerto Rico that got to participate. Um, because we, are, we belong to, we're not completely part of the United States, and so it was always a weird relationship, still is. Um, the billboard that I did, lasted less than a day. It was, it was censored uh, by uh, an electoral commission there because it criticized the state of the party. And it was essentially a, a picture of a sculpture that was a, uh, a Klan hood that was made out of the campaign flags of the pro-statehood party, which also includes the American flag in it. And it just said statehood. Oh, there it is. Good timing. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. Look at that. What? So... <laughs> so it, it, it lasted like less than a day. Um, and if you were following news recently, like Bad Bunny had, if you follow this at all in Puerto Rico, he took out a bunch of billboards critiquing uh, the same administration and Jennifer Gonzalez, who is the candidate for governor for the Sacred Party. And those were also taken down uh, very quickly, but he got a lot more mileage of them and he had several of them. So the same issues eight years later, questioning uh, the leadership of a party that would align itself with Trump uh, in an administration that emboldens white supremacy and white supremacists and is so at odds with the interests of Puerto Rican people, obviously. So um, all again, very timely, as you know, or may know just from the recent comments here at MSG and the lineup for Trump. And all I wanna say uh, in closing is that what it made me think about in terms of um, the relevance of all of this today and Puerto Rico being compared to garbage or an island of garbage is that um, 55 years ago, and this is like in the diaspora, in the Puerto Rican community, East Harlem, Spanish Harlem, the first, uh, the first offensive, the first uh, public action of the Young Lords was the garbage offensive. So another kind of like uh, context for a garbage offensive, you know, um, but it was literally uh, the community organ, and it was led by the community. That issue was was first uh, uh, led by the community, and the Young Lords took it on uh, because the city treated us like garbage and treated Black and Brown communities like garbage and poor communities like garbage, and so they cleaned up the community. And, and demanded to live in dignity and, and challenged the racism of the city and of, of the local government um, head on. And it was a very successful campaign, but it's all made me think about sort of the continuity of this history, issues on the island, issues in the diaspora, and the necessity just to keep it going forward. So I'm grateful. Thank you again for doing everything. And grateful for the book because for the few hours that the billboard was up, it's gotten a lot more uh, publicity through the book and through the online posting. So thank you. Hi, uh, my name is John Santos. Um, I can't thank you guys enough for doing all the work that you've done and getting together the book. Um, I saw these guys out in um, LA and I showed up pretty jaded because I get pretty jaded, especially when we see the way that images and messaging are manipulating everybody. I mean, even if you're manipulated to challenge what's being said to you. And when I left LA, I thought about when I was a kid and how um, whenever I enc enc encountered artwork that I would never have access to see, it was like a really life-changing experience. And so I stopped thinking about adults and I thought about how young people in, the, in all these places where you guys play, place the billboard could be so moved. You know, so I forgot about being an adult that lived in New York City that has access to so much media and information. And so this, the, the making of this book 
And the execution of the work, I think, is so much po more powerful than my jaded kind of New York City mindset. And so I just wanted to say thank you, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Thank you for that. Hi, everyone. My name is Joshua Allen. So beautiful to see you all tonight. Um, I'll share a quick story about my billboard, which was really special for me to put together. Um, at the time that we did this billboard, I was 24, turning 25. Um, and it was a really pivotal, transformational point in my life where I was moving from focusing on activism and putting my life force towards that, towards moving more into arts and giving myself a permission to do a new dance in the world. Um, so much of the work that I was doing as an activist was focused on anti-violence, anti-incarceration, anti-transphobia, anti-queerphobia, and it was draining to my spirit and to my soul. And so doing this billboard gave me a chance to kind of do a new dance in the world for the first time, to let the world see me in a new light, a dignified and empowered light. And it's been so special because young people um, from all across the country have said to me, oh my God, Josh, not just because of this billboard, but for other reasons too. Um, <laughs> But um, Josh, you make me feel like it's possible for me to do other things in the world too. You make me feel like it's possible to live a life that's dignified and empowered, and it's been a great gift for me. Um, when I think about that transition from activist to artist, I think a lot about what Maya Angelou says. When she says, um, leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that is wondrously clear. And that's what this project represents for me. So thank you all so much for coming and looking at it. Yeah, let's get Sean up here. <laughs> and also, there's a lot of people, especially people who worked with us, that are in the hallway that can come in. There's more space. Hello, for you. Come in, come in. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sean. Uh, I was the editor on this project at Monticelli Biden. And um, this is such a beautiful full circle moment for me personally, because Philip, if you remember, the very first week that I started at Monticelli, we went to a panel at Photograph Isca, and um, you guys made me weep. <laughs> and um, it was such a special moment. And that's the first time that I met Hank and Eric and some others. And it was such an honor to work on this book with you guys. And um, I'll be careful about how I say this next bit because my bosses are in the audience. <laughs> but it is a real rare pleasure to be stressed about something that matters. And we spent countless nights, weekends, vacation, Wyatt, was on the phone with the kids in the back of the car, coming back from the amusement park. Like we made it work. This was such a labor of love and it's all due to their generosity and kindness and compassion. And there's so many things to love about this book. I love seeing people flip through the book. It's so beautiful, um, but it really, I don't even know how to put into words how special it is to work towards something that matters and that has an impact. And any moment that was stressful because books are really complicated, it was the most beautiful kind of stress that there is possible. And I think it is so special, especially hearing from some of the artists tonight that the billboards lived in a time and now they live in the book forever. And I just, I'm so grateful to have worked with you guys. I love you guys. And um, let's do another book. Yeah, we're in. Book. We already have ideas. <laughs> we, I, can we, maybe one more person, if Carly Fisher, I don't know where she's sitting, but Carly Fisher was an integral part to this book coming together. She edited every text that you see in there, spent hours on it. Um, and so Carly, if you want to say something. Um, this was really moving to hear so many of the artists talk about what the billboard meant to them in the moment that it was made. I feel like um, often in making the book, you have such closeness and also such distance. And it felt like we were zooming out. Um, and I wanna offer two of the things that I learned in the making of this book that were really transformative for me or two of the phrases that came up. The first is that Eric, you offered that Four Freedoms was a language project 
more than anything. And actually, um, that for me has become that justice is a language project, that justice is both an act of community and an act of language. And so the way that that's modeled in this book is really beautiful and I feel very grateful for it. And the other that feels connected to that is that there was such a regionality and also a national framework for this book. And one of the things that I didn't know is that in the early billboard conversations, when things were censored by billboard companies, often they were censored regionally or in a specific state. And it was a way of marking what was taboo in that area. And there were places where talking about religion specifically was too taboo for billboard companies to be able to ask the landlords who owned the land that the billboards were on to show that there. And there were other places where incarceration was too taboo. And so this framework of censorship became a way of mapping out the language that is allowed, the community that is allowed in each specific place, and the way those things are connected to each other. And the culmination of all of that that's so exciting for me is how you've thought about billboards as monuments, that monuments, there's no requirement that monuments are permanent because nothing is permanent. Even the ones that we think are permanent won't stay forever. And so the fact that the time in the way that we had such distance and also so such closeness to this project as we were making the book, the way that time is marked in this room today, hearing all of you talk about what the moment meant with your billboard and what it means now, um, I'm just struck by the fact that the book stands as a monument, but also it is a record of all of the monuments that each of you made. So I'm deeply grateful to all of you um, and grateful to be here. That was really Thank you. Any other responses? Both and beautiful work or experience. Having the opportunity to to work with everyone and to share moments of with all of Hank's friends and colleagues, it basically encouraged me as a teacher, you know, and a mother. <laughs> but the idea of language, and I think it's really important to think about the message. You know, we think about ideas from, you know, pop culture to music and to share these moments have been just transformative to me. And I'd like to say thank you. And there's a reception outside and there are books available. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. <laughs> And I, Deb, I think this is so nice to be here with you because I think the kind of community that we've been able to build over the years of artists is a direct lineage of the kind of community that you've built over decades. And um, it's just such an inspiration to be able to share a room with you. Yeah. Joe, do you like that? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so books are available at the by Janice. Janice, can you raise your hand? So by Janice at the back, books are available. Um, in LA, we did this thing that rocked that artists all had name tags that had their numbers on it. Are we doing? We have we're doing that here too. Okay, all artists that are in the book have name tags that have their name and the page number. So if you want them to sign your book on the page number, we have a bunch of sharpies around. We'll all be here, artists. If you want to come up here too, and we can kind of sign any books that people have here. Um, but thank you so much, everyone.